scripture reading this morning will be from the book of James, uh, chapter 3, beginning with verse 13 through 15. <clears throat> Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This is wisdom. Does, uh, this wisdom does not descend from heaven or from above, but in earthly, sensual, and demonic. Maybe see. Well, thank you once again that God has blessed us with this opportunity to worship Him in spirit and in truth. As we often say, we know that this life is filled with a lot of things that the devil throws our way. It's always refreshing for the soul to be able to come back out and be with individuals like yourselves who are interested in studying God's Word and feasting upon that spiritual manna that we discussed this morning in our Bible study. We hope that as we go through the lesson this morning, it will be one that will help each of us to take something away from it that will help us to draw closer to God. If you're visiting with us, we are honored that you're here. We hope that anyone, whether you're a visitor or not, if you have questions about the lesson this morning, uh, feel free to ask myself or any of the brethren here. I'm sure we would be happy to give you a Bible answer for a Bible question. Appreciate the brethren for leaving, uh, reading the scriptures a moment ago. They give us there an opportunity for us to get our minds on what we're talking about today. Here in James chapter 3, James talks about some important uh, concepts here. And among the things he talks about, he references the... Uh, the idea of who thinks that they're wise, who thinks that they have a good understanding. And if, and if you're amongst those individuals that think that you fall in that category, he says, well, well, let's prove that by the life that you live, by the conduct that you engage in in your life. He says that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Then he goes on and says the opposite end of that would be those that are giving in to bitter envy, that give in to selfish uh, self-seeking, as he says, you're boasting, and as a result of you not engaging in what he says here as far as what is in the meekness of wisdom, you find yourself uh, lying against the truth. In other words, you say that you're serving God, you say that you have this wisdom, you say that you're conducting yourself one way, but in reality, you're not. And he says as a result, that type of wisdom is not from God, it's not heavenly, it's earthly, and as a result, it is connected to to sin. It's earthly, sensual, demonic. In other words, it comes from the devil. It's, it's sinful. Now, in order for an individual to be the wise individual that he mentions in verse 13, he alludes to the idea that one is to conduct themselves in the meekness of wisdom. And this word here is what we're going to look at today. We've been talking some time now uh, in our uh, for, on a series of lessons from Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, Jesus uh, discusses what we call the Beatitudes. And he mentions seven ingredients of uh, the characteristics, characteristic building ingredients, uh, characteristic of the heart, that each of us uh, should strive to, to uh, be more efficient at in our lives, to strive to have more abundantly in our lives. And, and, if we can, and if we can incorporate these ingredients, if you will, into our lives, we can rejoice and be exceeding glad, as he says in verse 12. In other words, we can truly enjoy the blessings that God ha has prepared for us in this life and serve God joyfully in this life and ultimately uh, enjoy eternal blessings with God in heaven. We talk about the poor in spirit and how that we need to be uh, understanding that we should be spiritually bankrupt. That is, that we have to fully rely upon God for everything in this life, our, our spiritual sustenance, if you will, and we connect to that to the idea of being humble. We talked last week about those who mourn. That is, we are to mourn sin. We talked about uh, the wrong kind of mourning, and we talked about uh, spiritual mourning. We mourn our sins. We mourn the effects that sin has, and we mourn uh, the sins that, that does in the lives of others. And we talked about the result of that. If we mourn sin and, and, and we realize the, uh, the negative effects that it has in our lives and, and we mourn uh, in the right way, then we'll find ourselves comforted in that we turn to God, we turn to His Word, and we find comfort in His Word. Now James talked a moment ago about those that uh, need to practice being poor in spirit and those that need to mourn sin because 
uh, if they say that they're wise and they say that they are living godly, then they should be able to, to show that by the conduct in their life. And that conduct would also entail meekness in their life. And if there's no meekness in our life, then what's going to happen is we're going to find ourselves engaging in various sins, that he says in verse 15 there, that is not from above. That is, we're going to be living a life that is not in submission to God. And so the thing is, that we're going to talk about this morning, when we think about our series of lessons on the Beatitudes, understanding that when the Bible says in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The concept of being meek is similar uh, similar to the idea of being poor in spirit, uh, in that you need to be humble and you need to be submissive to God. But there's more to it, and I want us to think about it from a little bit of a different perspective today. And, and, and hopefully when we get through the lesson, we'll have a better understanding of what it means to be me. To help us to live that life that is based upon God's wisdom. And uh, do what James tells us to do there in James chapter 3. What does the word meek mean? Let's look at the definition of it, or, or the Greek word of it, to get a, a better definition of it. In Matthew 5, 5, when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, the Greek word that is translated meek is spelled P-R-A-U-S. And if you look at this word in a Strong's Concordance, it would be word number 4239. And it would tell you in that concordance that it is connected to the idea of being mild. In other words, humble, or as it's translated, meek. And so we understand when we talk about someone being humble, uh, they are a meek individual. But there's uh, something we need to understand about it that we'll see as we go through the lesson. That is... Just being humble doesn't make you someone that is weak or that is uh, as, the, as our society would see it. And it says there is a word that's connected to it that is similar in spelling to it. That's P-A, rather P-R-A-O-S. And that word means uh, gentle. In other words, humble or meek. As Jesus says in Matthew 11 and verse 29, the word uh, meek is there in our King James Bible and it comes from that P-R-A-O-S word. But if you look it up in another translation, like the New King James, it would say, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. If you think about the fruit of the Spirit, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit is gentleness. And uh, when David preached that wonderful series about the fruit of the Spirit, uh, recall he, he made the connection to being meek and to being gentle. And that's uh, spot on when we think about the definition of, of what it means to be meek. Now, the word meek is found in the King James Bible four times. Uh, the word meek, not meekness or, or, or meekly, but the word just meek. It's translated meek in four scriptures in the New Testament. Matthew 5, 5, Matthew 11, 29, Matthew 21, 5, and 1 Peter 3, 4. Now, as we study this lesson today, what I hope we'll understand uh, from, from the angle we're going to go about it today is understanding that to be meek is to be someone that has... Uh, brought their spirit under control through God, through obedience to God. You might call that being God-tamed. Think about maybe like a, 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 a horse, or we might call it a, a wild stallion out in the, out in the field that is uh, full of this raw talent that is uh, just out in the wild doing whatever it wants, it has such potential, full of energy, full of strength, and, and it needs, but once it's brought under control by, by someone, once it's once it's uh, brought under the control of a master, it's tamed. And it's, it can then live up to its full potential because that raw talent can be molded and used for, uh, for something that's far better, maybe turned into a racehorse or a workhorse, and things along those lines. And so what we're talking about this morning, when we talk about being meek, is we're talking about being God-tamed, if you will, for, uh, to, to point that, or not to point that phrase, but just for lack of a better a word. I mentioned a moment ago about the idea of being meek, and I said that it doesn't mean that you're weak. Let's think about that for a second. When we think about the word meek today, our culture has taken what the word meek means in the Bible, and they, our culture portrays someone that is meek as someone that is weak. If you are considered meek, well, you're somebody that must be a winner. Your pushover. One author I was reading uh, called it milk toast, uh, not 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 milk bread, but pretty much the same, right? Milk toast. I don't know. I've never used that phrase, but I can imagine in my mind, you know, if you took a piece of uh, uh, 
crunchy toast and dip it in milk, it's going to be soggy. It's going to be soft. It's, not, it's going to just be something that's just going to be useless. Well, that's the point uh, that people think of when they think of uh, that you're meek. You're softy. You're somebody that is a pushover. And the thing is, if you want to get anywhere, anywhere in this life, well, you can't be meek. You've got to look out for number one. Number one is who you're going to look at, at, out for, and it doesn't matter the cost. Whatever the cost is, you look out for number one. And if you're not looking out for number one, you're a weakling, you're, and, and, you, and you say you're meek, well, that's just uh, something society would frown upon. Well, let's think about that, and let's look at some examples. What we're talking about is, when the Bible talks about being meek, what the Bible's definition of meek is, is we're not, it's not saying that we're a marshmallow. We're not marshmallows, but we're masters of self. Through submission to God. It's very hard for me to study about meekness without thinking of the concept of self-control. Uh, bringing uh, my raw talents under control in submission to God. And understanding that though I may have the ability to do certain things, uh, strength and, and so on, uh, I need to hone those skills and, and use those to the betterment of serving God. And that takes strength. And that takes courage. And so to be meek is not in any way to be weak. Let's look at some examples. If you think about somebody in the Bible that the Bible says was the meekest man that ever lived, other than our Lord, the Bible says it was Moses. So it would do us some good to think about Moses. Now a moment ago I mentioned the, the concept of this uh, untamed animal, that once it's tamed, it's able to live up to its full potential. Well, you look at the life of Moses. Now before Moses was called meek. He lived in a way that was, that was far removed from being meek. Prior to his service to God, we learn in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, it came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Here's this man prior to bringing his life under the control to God, who is an individual who is far removed from what, what the Bible teaches is meek or gentle or mild. This is an individual who, in, his, in, in this point of his life, he is someone that when he saw this, this Egyptian doing wrong to this Hebrew, he went all the way to the point of being willing to strike the Egyptian to the point that he killed him. He committed murder. But then we know, as we study the, the lesson about Moses, we find that later on God appears to him in the birth of Israel. God uh, drafts him to be the leader of the children of Israel. He leads them out of, out of Egypt. And you see a different kind of character in Moses now that he has served God for a number of years. And so when we think about when the Bible said he was meek, the Bible says that in the context of something that happened to Moses. There was an incident in the life of Moses here in the book of Numbers where uh, something happens to Moses. And the Bible it, it parenthetically basically says that Moses was, was meek above everyone on the face of the earth. And if we think about that incident and look at what he did or didn't do, that helps us understand just how meek he was and, and why the Bible says he was meek and what it means to be meek. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, the Bible tells us about a time when Miriam and Aaron basically began to grumble against Moses. And it says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And so here in Numbers chapter 12, it tells us in the first two verses here, there's this time when, uh, as I said, Aaron and Moses' sister Miriam began to murmur against him. It's interesting that, that in light of what we studied this morning in our Bible study about how God knows uh, our complaints and he knows our needs, he hears our complaints, it says here that he heard it. He heard what Aaron and Miriam said. He knew that they were uh, complaining and murmuring against him. But it says in verse 3 that he was meek. It tells us he gets these complaints, but then just immediately tells us he was meek. 
So what does that mean to us? How exactly was he meek when we think about what happened here? Now, if you go on and you read in the chapter, it helps us understand how he was meek uh, in, in the eyes of God. If you notice verse 4, it says, um, in, in Numbers chapter 12, it says, Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out, and the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. Then he said, and then God casts his judgment upon them, and, and, he, he, and he says that they speak against Moses. Verse 9 says God's anger was aroused against them. You get down to about verse 10 uh, and 11 and 12. God, uh, as a result of their murmuring against God, uh, Miriam becomes leprous as a result of this. And then uh, and she's cast out of the camp for seven days and then she's healed. Well, here's the thing. Or rather, she's healed and cast out of the camp. How was this an example of Moses being meek? Well, let's think about what happened here. Now, I skimmed through the chapter, but again, if we think about it, one of the things happened was Moses was spoken against. And something that it never says in this chapter is that Moses retaliated. You think back to the Moses that we read about in Exodus chapter 2, that saw the Egyptian who was harming the Israelite, Moses uh, killed him. Here you have Miriam and Aaron speaking out against Moses, and not once does it say Moses said anything at all. It says that he held his, he just basically he held his peace. And so you think about meekness from that standpoint. If somebody is speaking against us, we have the inclination that we want to speak back against them. We want to retaliate. But notice something about meekness then tells us that meekness is inner strength of character. That, that in which we say, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm going to stand. My, I'm going to stand here, and I'm and I'm going to let God deal with their sin. In the book of Romans, chapter twelve, verse nineteen, Paul writes about the idea that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That we're not to be those that retaliate on against others. If somebody speaks out against us, we're not to speak out against them. We're not to. If somebody gets me, I'm going to get them back. If somebody said something about me, I'm going to tell people something on them. It doesn't work that way. If I'm going to be gentle, I'm going to be someone that is meek. And not only did Moses hold his ground and, and, and hold his tongue and let God deal with him, he also showed kindness. And Bible, the Bible says that, as I said earlier, Miriam uh, became leprous. But if you notice verse 13, it says, uh, well, verse 12, uh, Please uh, do not let her be as, as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. And so uh, that it goes on, and, and God says some things to Moses, but then in verse 15, she shut out of the camp, uh, and so on, because of the uncleanness that she had. But the point from here is, is instead of Moses saying that she got what she deserved, or instead of Moses uh, just walking away or what have you, he shows compassion to her and asks God to uh, to take that leprosy away from her. And so he shows compassion, unlike the Hebrew that he, uh, that he killed in Exodus chapter 2. And so what you have here is a much different Moses, a much different person than the person we read about in chapter 2. What's the difference? The difference is, is he's been living a number of years now in service to God. God has brought him under control. He is now someone that is God-tamed. He's someone that is living his life in submission to God, and, and is living a life uh, for God. And so what we get from this is the idea that meekness is self-control through submission to God. Every one of us as Christians needs to practice self-control that is based upon God's Word or through submission to God. This is what the Bible says in Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey the magistrates, to be ready uh, to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. We ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Now ultimately, the ultimate uh, power that we need to submit to is God. And by submitting to God, God teaches us about how to live a life of meekness, where the meek are individuals that 
that are in submission to God and live a life called a quiet life, a quiet and meek life, and that we are those that recognize that we are uh, our place in, in life. And he says in verse 1, uh, be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates. And then he connects that to speaking evil of no man. There's no gentleness, there's no meekness in my life if I uh, decide to uh, constantly ridicule and, 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 and constantly uh, say negative <coughs> things about those who the Bible says I'm to be in subjection to. We realize that in the day and age we live in, the idea of uh, political, uh, the political atmosphere is, is very charged, they say, uh, as, as the media puts it. And we can find ourselves in situations where we're tempted to say things uh, that we ought not to say. Say things about individuals that we ought not to say. Constantly complaining, constantly murmuring. And the Bible tells us that's against what Titus states here in Titus 3 and verse 1. And, and in verse 2, because we're to speak evil of no man. We might disagree with somebody's policies. We may think somebody uh, might be better fit for a position, but we should be careful uh, in expressing those opinions and expressing those views because we don't want to find ourselves speaking evil and getting to the point that we might be considered brawlers. You know, here we think about Moses. When Moses killed the Egyptian, Moses was a brawler. But then we find when Moses had lived a life under submission to God, and he found himself in opposition by his own brother and sister, he showed gentleness instead and meekness toward them, in that he held his peace, and that he did not speak out against them, and he showed forgiveness towards them. And that's an example for you and I today. And so we find in verse 3, he says, we were sometimes living in these various different sins, he says, it takes strength of heart. It takes meekness, submission to God, in order for us to turn away from that life and not give in to the temptations to go back and live that life. And so through submission to God, we meekly uh, submit to those in authority, we said. We meekly control our speech, the way we talk to others, whether it be any situation, <laughs> just political. But the way we talk to others, we talk to people with respect, with manners, with kindness, with compassion, and we control our tempers. And of course, we understand that's one of the uh, things the Bible talks about in order to become an elder, is to be one that's not a brawl, not a striker, someone that's not quick to anger. And every Christian uh, should strive as well to have those characteristics in their life, and that's part of being meek, to display gentleness and humility to others, to... Uh, to have the attitude that we're going to be uh, quick to anger and ready to fight somebody because they disagree with us or say evil against them is not practicing self-control, is not practicing meekness. And as a result, we realize the meekness then is we practice self-control over past sin. We might look back on our lives, like we talked about this morning in our Bible study, and think about how that things might have seemed like they were better before we submitted to God because it just we're just not engaging in the same uh, worldly pleasures that we used to engage in. But if we have meekness of heart, we realize the things of this life aren't worth the spiritual blessings that we have and, and the eternity of bliss we can have with God. That's one of the things the Hebrew writer says about Moses in Hebrews 11, that he, that he decided not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than those in Egypt. And so we realize and understand the same when we practice meekness in our lives. No better example is uh, of meekness then uh, would be Jesus. We talked about Moses, and let's talk about Jesus for a moment. Was Jesus a pushover? Is the question I want to think about. And the answer to that question is no. Here in these scriptures I have listed up here on the board in Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 11, Luke chapter 19, and John chapter 2 are the times recorded for us when Jesus cleansed the temple. And Jesus cleansing the temple, of course, is, is completely opposite of what the world would consider to be someone that's meek. He was not showing weakness when he cleansed the temple. But he was showing meekness. How did he show meekness? Well, first of all, let me ask, answer the question, was he meek? Yes, he was. We looked at John, or Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 30 through 30. He said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now how can we, uh, how do we connect these two uh, examples to one another? Cleansing the temple, yet saying he's meek. Well, let's think about it from the standpoint of what we're talking about, of having self-control. 
Jesus cleansed the temple, but the Bible doesn't tell us that he struck them with his fist or that he or anything like that. He took a whip and he and he ran them out. But the Bible doesn't tell us that he, he he did some sort of physical harm to them. He could have done so much more to them than what he did, in other words. So he showed self control there. He knew uh, how far to go and how to and how to hold back, if you will, in order to not cross the line. We know that he didn't sin when he did that because the Bible tells us that he did not sin. And the point then is, is that someone that is meek is is, is able to uh, rein in their spirit. They're able to rein in and have self-control and practice uh, strength when need be, like Jesus did when he cleansed the temple, but also show kindness and compassion at the same time. He was showing compassion to those people by getting them to stop committing the sins that they were committing, if you think about it. We think about Jesus being meek from what he said in John chapter 13 and verse 13, when Jesus uh, washed the feet of his disciples. He says, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. And this is what we're learning about when we think about the life of Jesus. If you look at the way he stood up against sin and the kindness and compassion he showed for sinners, is we are set, he has set the example for us of what it is to be me. And he says that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sinned greater than he that sinned him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Now, we've been talking about the Beatitudes. And each one of these Beatitudes begins with the phrase, blessed. And one of the aspects that we discussed that the idea of being blessed is happiness. Is, is exalted happiness. And Jesus says that if we follow his example, we're servants towards one another. We stand up for the truth, and yet at the same time we show kindness and compassion towards others, not giving in to, not losing our self-control and showing gentleness and such. He said if we live this kind of life of uh, serving one another, that I, that not re realizing that I'm not to be served, but I am to serve others, he said I'm going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. He says, happy are ye if you do them. So what if I don't practice meekness in my life? I'm not going to be blessed. I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be able to live the kind of life that he wants me to live in which I can be happy and follow his examples and live uh, by his righteousness. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So what did he do? What was his example that he set for us? Who did no sin, so we know that he didn't sin when he placed the temple. Neither was guile found in his mouth. He didn't lie like those that, uh, that James talked about or, or, or anyone else that would sin against God. No, neither guile was found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Much like Moses, when Aaron and Miriam spoke out against him, Moses held his peace. Jesus held his peace. Imagine when he, when he was reviled, that he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges right, righteously. Here is Jesus, and he's been arrested. He's been arrested by uh, human beings whom he, the Bible says, everything was created by and for him. Here he's allowing himself to be beaten. He's allowing himself to be whipped with the, uh, with the uh, cat and nine tail. He's allowing himself to be mocked. He's allowing himself to have all these things happen to him. And, the, and at one point in time, we read that he said he, if he wanted to, he could have called 12 legions of angels, but he didn't because he was meek. He practiced self-control. You or I, if we were in a situation like that, I, I don't know if we could, we could do that or not. I don't know that we could, we could control ourselves in that situation. When we find ourselves wrong in this life just on something that is very minute compared to what our Lord went through, we have the inclination to want to retaliate. And here our Lord, by his creation, is mistreating him, uh, to put it mildly, and yet he holds his mouth. He doesn't revile when he's reviled. He, do, he, doesn't, he doesn't threaten, but it says he committed himself. Why? Because he loved the world. He wanted. He knew that there was something better uh, when he accomplished what he needed to accomplish. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree that he, when he was crucified, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. We're healed by his stripes. That is, Jesus, when he was beaten and he, and he, and he went through all the things he went through, we obey the gospel that uh, as a result of his going to the cross, 
<coughs> we can be spiritually healed, have our sins forgiven. But we do this, he says, uh, by being, we uh, turn our backs on sin and turn our lives towards serving the Lord, he says, so that we should live unto righteousness. Well, part of that entails being meek and following his example. Uh, showing meekness as he did when he was reviled, he reviled not. And so when we think about being meek, we think about Moses, we think about Jesus. And what that helps us understand is, is we need to be meek towards God. In 1 Peter 4, verse 1 through 4, the Bible says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. So we're talking about being like Christ. And one of the things Christ did was live a life of meekness and gentleness. And it says here that, For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. They no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. And so here we have the idea of being brought under control of God. No longer are we living that life of being untamed and doing whatever we want. We're bringing our life in subjection to God when we practice meekness in our life. And we put away the things of the past. And that takes strength of heart. That takes uh, faith in God and reliance upon God in order to accomplish this. So he says in verse 3, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walk in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, uh, revelings, uh, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. So they lived this past life, this sinful life in the past. Now it's going to take something in order to, to put those things behind. It, obviously it takes submission to the, to the gospel, submission to Christ, and living a life in obedience to Him once we've done so. And that life teaches us about being meek. It teaches us about being in self-control. It teaches us about not uh, reminiscing about the past and going back and, and, and repeating those same mistakes that we made that he mentions there in verse 3. But what's going to happen is, is people are going to think it's odd. They're going to think it's strange. And that's going to require us to stand our ground and not let them pull us back out, back into the bondage of sin. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And so what I have you on the board is what I've been saying over and over. We submit to God. We take our old self, the life that we used to live, and we submit our life to God, and now my spirit is God-tamed. I'm serving God, and God directs my life. What I do in my life is based upon His Word. The decisions I make is based upon His Word. The gentleness that I, that I exhibit in my life is a gentleness that I learned through studying God's Word and looking at examples of individuals like Moses and looking at Jesus, the King of my life. And as a result, I become like that champion racehorse that was brought under subjection to its master. I am now under subjection to my master, Jesus Christ. And as a result, I can practice meekness in my life. That takes strength. You know, we tell our children <coughs> that if somebody tries to, to say something to you at school or try to pick a fight with you, we tell them that, that be, a, be a bigger person, be a better person, and walk away and don't get, in, don't get into an argument with them or get into a fight with them. You know, we didn't come up with that. That's found in the Bible. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32, it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The proverb right here is talking about the concepts we've been talking about all morning here. The idea of having our spirit under control. Not giving in to anger and malice and, and letting ourselves uh, give in to, to, to the sins of the world, but Bringing ourselves into, bringing our spirit under control in service to God. Now he said, "Blessed are the meek." And if we do that, what's going to happen? He said, "They shall inherit the earth." Let's talk about that. How? How will the meek inherit the earth? Now he's not talking about literally. Uh, this actually is uh, very similar, uh, almost word for word, what it says in the Book of Psalms. But the meek shall, in Psalm 37 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Now, the Israelites that we've been studying about were on their way to Canaan's land. And they were going to inherit that land if they meekly submitted to God, in other words. Well, we're not going to inherit land here at, literally, but by practicing meekness in our life. Submitting to those that are in authority, living a life that is uh, a good individual, an honest individual, productive member of society, one that is not easy to anger and a brawler and, and all the things that we mentioned here. We're going to be able to enjoy, truly enjoy, God.
God's blessings in this life. And that's how we inherit the earth. In his book, The Beatitudes, James Toll puts it this way. The meek do inherit the earth. They do indeed receive the best that human beings are able to enjoy in this present world. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or things present or things to come. All things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 21-23. Undoubtedly, all worthwhile things of this world are the possession of the meek. They may not legally own a square inch of land, but they recognize that the entire earth is Jehovah's and that all its beauty and grandeur is theirs to enjoy. That's what we're talking about when we talk about living a life of meekness. We, we set aside and look beyond the things of this world. We recognize our obedience to God, our, our need for God, the necessity for God. And we set aside all these worldly attributes, the anger, the, 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 the malice, the hatred. And, and, and we submit to God. And by submitting to God, we're going to live a better life, a happier life. A life where we say, doesn't matter to me what, whatever the world may, may, may throw at me. There's something better waiting for me in heaven. And while I'm on my way to heaven, I can enjoy what God has created and put here on this earth, and I can live a, a, a happy and, and meek life in service to God. And so that's how the meek shall inherit the earth. Now our lesson text, James said in James chapter 3, he talked about those that, that thought they were wise, that thought they were uh, living a certain way, but he said they needed to just practice meekness in their life if they were truly going to be wise. And if they don't, uh, well, then we're not showing the kind of submission to God that we need to show to God. And so James went on to say in James chapter 3, verse 16, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. To be meek isn't to seek self. To be meek is to seek God and serve others, to put others before ourselves. But the wisdom that is from above first is, from above is first pure, then peaceable. Notice this word. Gentle. There's the idea of being meek. Gentle. Willing to yield. Yield to what? Yield to God. Yield to His Word. Let God be the God in my life. And, good, and full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We're talking about being meek. And if I want to make peace with God, then I need to practice meekness in my life. Meekness, that I'm willing to submit to Him, that I'm willing to uh, let God tame me, that is to say that God's going to teach me how to live a life that isn't it, giving in to sin, that I don't give in to anything and everything that I want, but I'm, I'm living my life for what does God want me to do? What does God want me to have? How does God want me to talk? How does God want me to treat others? And when I do what, when I learn what God wants me to do and how He wants me to treat others, then I'm going to do those things, and, by, and, and then what I'm going to do is I'm making peace with God by submitting to His will. Are you here this morning? You're not a Christian. Are you ready to make peace with God? If, are you someone that's out in the fields of, uh, of the world, is doing whatever you want? You need to be and to come under the control of the Master, Jesus okay. Christ. Are you willing to do that? Are you ready to make peace with God? If you're a person that's not obeying the gospel. You make peace with God by obeying the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Once we hear that word, it teaches us about God and we believe it. We believe that God is and that He's rewarded of those that diligently seek Him. And it's impossible to come to God if we don't believe that. Hebrews 11 says. It teaches us to repent. It teaches us to humbly come under submission to God and turn away from, from a life of sin and put that life behind us. And put our life uh, on the path of serving God. In 13.3, Jesus said, I tell you today, but except you repent, you will all likewise perish. We confess that Jesus is God's Son. Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You're almost there. You're unto. You haven't quite gone through the door of salvation yet. When we came here this morning, if you went through those doors there, when you stood outside the parking lot, you're unto this room. It was when you went through those doors, you came into this room. Christ says, He is the door. When you confess that He's the Son of God, you're unto salvation. You're almost there. But then when you're baptized into Christ, you go through that door of salvation and you have your sins forgiven. As we taught in Acts 2, verse 37 in Galatians 3, 27. Maybe you've done that and you've fallen away. You're a child of God. You go back out into the world. 
meekly submit to him. More of those sins. Bring your spirit back under subjection to God by repenting of your sins. As Simon the Sorcerer was taught in Acts chapter 8. Repent of your sins. Seek God's forgiveness through prayer.